started here. Um, my name is Tony Barrett. I'm an assistant division administrator with the fisheries division, uh, leading our fisheries management team, and want to recognize a few other individuals that are going to be presenting tonight. Our, our, our Northeast District Supervisor, Jeff Shuckman, and uh, fisheries biologist, Phil Shabala, will also be uh, uh, giving some words and presenting some information. We have our division administrator for fisheries, Dean Rosenthal on, and a number of other fisheries uh, staff uh, online as well. And, and, and also from an agency standpoint, we have, we have folks from a lot of different divisions from our, from our communications, wildlife, law enforcement, parks, um, and really appreciate everyone being on. We should be able to handle quite a few of the uh, diversity of questions uh, folks have out there for us at the end of the meeting. I um, want to recognize, I think we're going to have um, uh, commissioner join us tonight, Pat Bergeron as well, and uh, there could be a few other commissioners pop in throughout the meeting. So uh, thanks for being here. Try to get this thing going. So first off, just want to talk a little bit about how this meeting is going to run and give you a few pointers on Zoom. Um, we, uh, we ask that everybody mutes their their microphones so we don't have some some of that collateral noise going on during presentations um, we also want folks to um, take their take their uh, cameras off video um, it helps with bandwidth so we do have a few videos that will be playing throughout the show and it helps us uh, maintain internet connectivity and then one other thing is uh, the dialogue between us and, and, and you will be done uh, mainly through the chat box uh, from your end. So we want, uh, as, as myself and the guys uh, present information as questions or comments pop up into your mind, go ahead and click on that uh, bottom, bottom icon, that chat icon, and type in your comments and questions as, as, as they go along. And we'll, we'll address those at the, uh, at the end of the end of the presentation. We have a, a moderator, Jordan Cott, uh, that will be uh, helping us out at that point. So just wanted to chat a little bit with, with everyone about uh, some things that are new for 2022. Hopefully, if you haven't had a chance to pick up the uh, 2022 fishing guide, hopefully you do. It's available online and at all of our different permit vendors. Uh, offices and in, in, in a lot of areas where, where bait and, and, and uh, tackle, shops, tackle shops are. Um, we have a number of different regulations that have been put, in the, put into place uh, over the last year. Uh, not a lot of them have uh, bearing on the Northeast District. Uh, one, of, one of the major ones is our paddlefish regulation that has um, uh, we've basically given the opportunity for, for individuals to purchase uh, to purchase preference points instead of just earning those along the way when you don't draw for a permit. So that's one of the major things that's happening uh, in the Northeast District as far as uh, regulation changes. But always a good idea to grab that booklet and uh, get familiar with the different regulations that we have out there. <laughs> Our aquatic habitat program. We wanted to highlight this tonight, just to let you know that we we've hit a we've hit a milestone. Um, back in 1997, um, and prior to that, and Jeff Jeff Shuckman will be able to uh, tell you a little bit about this as well. Is uh, our our agency was really struggling to um, find ways to enhance or, or conserve the habitat that we had out there in our different lakes, and reservoirs, and streams, and in 1997, uh, with the help of a lot of commission staff, commissioners, the legislation, we were able to implement the aquatic habitat stamp fee with all of our license, uh, licenses sold. And since then, we've been able to do a lot of different projects over that time. With it being 2022, uh, we are now 25 years into the program, and it's really time to celebrate all the successes because it has been very, very successful. We've done over 130 projects during this time, spanning all, all around uh, Nebraska from, from north to south, east to west. And 
And these projects uh, involve anything from simple angler access type projects to full on aquatic rehabilitations with uh, uh, dredging, excavation, sediment dikes um, implemented, um, and a lot of other uh, types of enhancements, including fisheries renovations, where we, where we chemically uh, renovate the fishery and, and start things over. So it's been a very impactful program to a lot of anglers over this time period all across the state. We're gonna be celebrating uh, this, this achievement at uh, Conestoga SRA in the Southeast part of the state on June 18th. Uh, we're, we're dubbing it a day at the lake where it's gonna be a large celebration, a lot of different vendors coming out, volunteers helping out and just basically a, a, a feel good event to promote fisheries and fishing in Nebraska. So welcome anybody that can make it that day. There'll be a lot of uh, information forthcoming on this event. A timely thing that's happening right now are our trout stockings. A number of water bodies have been already stocked throughout the state and in the Northeast District. And just wanted to mention that as, um, as a way uh, for people that are interested in, you know, with the weather we've been having to get out and, and, and enjoy this opportunity. Uh, these trout stockings are, are great for introductory anglers, kids, uh, Novice, novice anglers just trying to go out and create those memories, and that, that's what these these fish are for. We hope we hope folks can get out there and, and utilize them. Um, speaking about taking uh, people, taking kids fishing, we are uh, once again putting on our Taken Fishing campaign. Um, this has been a program that we've run the last few years, and it's been very successful. It it aims at um, you know mentors, either uh, people that are in the know or, or avid anglers, you know, taking their neighbor that hasn't been fishing ever or has, uh, hasn't been fishing in a long time or taking their children or taking somebody new out fishing and kind of passing that uh, tradition and that pastime along. Um, this taking fishing campaign, we do offer with submissions uh, a chance to win a lot of different prizes, different packages from uh, kayaks to all the way to different fishing getaways at some of our state parks so that include, you know, some, some high-end fishing gear as well as complimentary stays at cabins at our, at our state park areas. So I encourage you to um, check out this, this program, provided the link there in the, in the um, slide, and it's, it's really a great, great program to be a part of. Another timely thing, just want to uh, chat a little bit and actually show you a little bit behind the scenes on what's going on. Um, right now is the time where our crews are really starting to ramp up and uh, collect brood fish and eggs to um, eventually hatch and raise out in a lot of our uh, fish hatcheries throughout the state. Um, currently, or, or very recently, we've done some sauger collections, uh, musky collections. We're in the middle of some pike collections. And then here in a couple of weeks, we're gonna be doing some walleye brood collections that, that'll be filling up a, a lot of our hatcheries. And um, got a couple of uh, short videos. I hope they play through this uh, Zoom format that you can, uh, that I hope provides a little bit of insight into kind of some of the things that we do. So Jeff, if you could take over and play these videos. So that video displayed kind of our activities where we go out and collect those uh, large female walleyes to eventually, uh, eventually uh, take eggs from. 
And this next video coming up will show kind of that process from when we take them from the holding pens the next morning and start to uh, take eggs uh, and, and eventually fertilize them and then get them into our, get them into our hatchery. So um, go ahead and click ahead again, Jeff. Or, um, there you go. So there's a lot of uh, other processes that go on with uh, the different types of spawning, spawning operations we, we have, but just uh, wanted to give you a little bit of insight in, into this, uh, these walleye collections. So hopefully that provided that. Let's see if I can't click ahead here. So this, this uh, shows a map of uh, our state um, and delineated into our four different districts. Um, and obviously you, you're, we're attending the Northeast District tonight. Um, right after this meeting at eight o'clock Central, uh, seven o'clock uh, Mountain Time, we're gonna be having our Northwest District meeting. So uh, at this point, I'm gonna have uh, Jeff and Phil uh, go ahead and take it away and they're gonna provide some updates on uh, projects and things going on in, in the Northeast part of the state. There we are, can you hear me now? to be on board. I want to yep. welcome everybody tonight. Hope we're not messing up your lunch hour tonight or supper because that six o'clock hour, that six o'clock time start. <clears throat> but we're going to talk a little bit about Northeast Nebraska. I'm Jeff Shuckman. This is Phil Cheval over here. And uh, we're going to talk about our district. And Northeast District encompasses 29 counties. And I guess the, the, the main thing you can say about our district is the diversity. We have a number of sand pit lakes, sand hills lakes, you know, natural lakes, all the way from the hardwood forest along the Missouri River to, to the natural sand hill lakes on, on the west. Uh, and there's flood control reservoirs and irrigation reservoirs uh, along the way. So, uh, and you throw in a few trout streams and we've got a very diverse uh, area and fishing opportunities in this district. And um, currently there's just the two of us for the management staff in this district. Andy Glidden was stationed at the Bassett duty station. He retired at the end of the year and we're in the process of hopefully getting that job filled one of these days. Uh, we've got the Calamus Fish Hatchery in the district uh, with four full-time staff down there and they do a fantastic job raising fish for us. And we have the Gro Grove Trout Rearing Station near Royal with three full-time staff there. And, and we've got a, a new superintendent, Joe Casty, took over the reins as the superintendent there. Had been the assistant for a number of years. And Steve Wilhelm uh, recently uh, left the agency for a different job. And Joe took over up there at Grove. And again, those guys do a fantastic job raising trout for us. A lot of the trout that you're going you're, you're, you're to have the opportunity to catch in the next week or two uh, have come from the Grove Trout Range Station. You'll find out what quality fish they really are. We're going to talk about a lot of different subjects tonight, and here's kind of an outline on that. We're going to talk about aquatic habitat projects, motorboat access, angler access, a bunch of different things. And um, before we get started, I want to say one thing. Watching the videos of the walleye spawn take operation, 
brings back a lot of good good memories and and if Commissioner Bergeron's watching, uh, I'll bet he's chomping at the bit to get out there and help those guys again this year and really gets the juices flowing watching that video and knowing the springs springs upon us and things are really going to start to happen. But I also want to mention and expand on what Tony was talking about with the aquatic habitat program. 25 years old now. It doesn't, doesn't seem like it's been that long. But prior to that stamp coming into place, a lot of the lake that we work that we wanted to do on our lakes as biologists was just, just a dream because we didn't have any funding. We had a number of projects outlined and things we wanted to do to, to protect our lakes and make our fishing better, and we simply couldn't do it. And it was it was through uh, you know people like Don Gablehouse who proposed that idea and the public, you anglers, that made that possible. I remember very well the public meetings that we had to discuss projects back in the mid to late 90s. And, and the biggest concern here was getting a room big enough out at Northeast Community College to house everybody because we had so many public show up interested in that and had projects to talk about. So I wanna commend the public for getting behind it, supporting that because it's, it's your expenditure of funds that made everything possible for that. And we were able to leverage that money with our some of our federal aid money and other grants. And we've really been able to do some good things uh, for fisheries. I, I keep saying it's one of the best things that happened for fisheries management uh, since I've been here uh, about 40 years in Norfolk. So um, hats off to everybody that, that supports that program and continues to buy the permits. So with that, we'll get on to a, a, a current aquatic habitat project and that's at Summit Lake. I'm getting a lot of calls and questions about this thing. Um, this was the site of one of the first big aquatic habitat projects back in 2000, 2001. When we drained the lake and renovated it, put in 13 breakwater jetties, uh, did some excavation, a lot of habitat work. And, uh, but it's been, been over 20 years ago. And uh, the sediment basins on both arms have filled in. So we uh, came up with a project to dig out the basins on the south and west arms and, um, and, and along the way do a little bit of in-lake excavation around the campground area, put in some vegetation slash spawning area, uh, habitat work. Um, Going to put in a kayak launch by the south boat ramp to keep things separated. <clears throat> I should mention that occasionally we get some, some uh, conflicts between kayaks and and, and motor boats launching at the boat ramp areas. And uh, it's gonna be advantageous for us to put in more of these kayak, kayak launches as we go forward and try to uh, separate the two a little bit. And I think it'll be a lot better. And uh, hopefully uh, have some kayak launch areas attached to some docks so an old guy, guy like me with bad knees can, can get in out of the kayak because it's, it's, it's quite a show when I'm trying to get out of a kayak now. But also on the south arm, there's going to be an equestrian crossing. It'll be a, a low water crossing where um, horses can get across the, the, the trail that goes around the lake. Uh, so we got a lot of things going on at Summit. And uh, work began in, in December of 2021, last de December, and is ongoing as we speak. And it's expected to last at least until this May. It might be a little bit beyond that. But, um, you know, I don't want people to panic with the lake being down about 10 feet at this time. Um, we are going to try to get that lake back up by the spring fishing season. But I want to show you and share with you some pictures that I took last week when I was down there looking at the area. And uh, the, the photo on the left shows in front of the campground area on the west arm. This is about 16,000 yards of sediment that came out of here. If you've been down to some, you know that was pretty shallow. And that was excavated out to eight feet deep now. And you can see some of these vegetation barrier slash spawning areas uh, along that shoreline also. And if you look in the distance up here to the north, you can see the north boat ramp. There was some excavation done, done there. About 6,000 yards came out of there and a couple of the vegetation barrier sites put in there also. We transition over to the south arm, the sediment trap on the south arm is about half dug out at this time. And there's uh, about 25,000 cubic yards coming out of there. And um, they're working with an excavator and some dozers in there now. And uh, like I said, they're about half done. 
the equestrian crossing will be in this area right here. And uh, they're putting spoil up on the hillside up here now, but they're getting there. They have to get the south arm done before we can bring the lake back up. And another thing they need to get done before we bring the lake back up is they need to get some work done on the boat ramp. We've, we've had some of the concrete start to bust up along the edge. So that's gonna be cut out, re-poured. There's gonna be a section in the middle of the boat ramp, cut out, re-poured. And that has to be done obviously before the lake can come back up. And uh, so they're gonna start on that very soon, probably next week. And I wanted to show you a close up view of the vegetation barrier slash spawning areas. These are 20 foot by 30 foot up, up to the shoreline and they'll be in one to two feet of water. It'll be easy to see, but there's a vegetation barrier blanket underneath these. And then there's some larger rock to hold that down and then some smaller crushed rock for a good surface for fish to spawn on. And there's about 25 of these that, that went in around the lake and they'll be quite easy to find. So they should be something for anglers to look for this spring. And I also included a photo that I took last week of the west sediment basin on the west arm. And obviously you can see when it's deep water like this, you can see why we had to clean these out. They were completely full of sediment. And uh, so the thought is we can bring the, get the boat ramp work done, get south arm down, we can bring the lake up uh, bef and, and still work on this west arm. They can excavate that while the lake is up and we, we can allow boat access for fishing. Um, this whole project is a little over $1.1 million. So it's quite an expenditure, um, considering that 20 years ago, we did the entire rehab project, renovation, 13 jetties and a whole bit for about a million bucks. So uh, inflation takes over and now we can just get the sediment basins redug out for 1.1 million. So that just shows you how much uh, the, the funding has, has the, or the expense and cost has gone up in 20 years. So a couple more things about Summit. We, we do um, realize that that, you know, it'd be nice if we could have done a full rehab project. We just didn't have the funding for it. So we were taking what's, what's a priority right now. But in the future, we need to do some more brushing projects in there and, and to get some, not only some cedars, but I'd like to see some log piles put back in there um, because some of it is, is a tremendous fishery, remains a tremendous fishery. And we certainly want to take care of that area. So next project we got going in terms of aquatic habitat is Gracie Creek Pond out at the Calamus Reservoir. For about the third time in its history, it was damaged in the 2019 flooding. So this project has been uh, on the books for a while. It's a FEMA uh, funded, funded project, at least for part of it. About 30,000 yards of material needs to come out of this, this pond. So it's gonna be a pretty big project. You can see the schematics over on the right. Here, here's where the pond is and shows excavated areas. We're going to take the spoil about a half mile or so down the road and uh, mound it up, blend it in with the existing sand hills on Bureau property. One other feature of this thing, uh, this project is not only are we going to reclaim it, we're going to put in what we call mitigation work, which is a, a, a sediment dike on the upper end with the rock flow through area to allow the stream to come into the pond. But we're gonna to try to capture the sediment on the upper end and then have a couple of jetties extending out that we can get a long reach hoe on and periodically pull that sand out because there is a constant base load sand coming down Gracie Creek from the watershed. The amount of sand coming down the watershed uh, varies depending on the amount of flow we get in a particular year. Dry water years or dry years, we don't have the, the flow and the sand transport. Uh, obviously in wet years, we get a lot of sand transport and we might have to dig this area out a couple times a year. So it'll remain to be seen, but we can dig it out, put it on trucks, temporarily store it and then haul it off to a spoil site. And it looks like uh, NDOT will probably take most of the spoil that we pull out of there. They're always looking for something. One other aspect of this project is we're gonna do some work on the downstream side of the highway. And those of you that are white bass fishermen are probably familiar with, with uh, the opportunity out here in the spring of the year for white bass. And uh, we're gonna try to enhance that a little bit by coming in below the box culvert. And uh, there, there was you know, a lot of water obviously flowed through there uh, in 2019, but, but having that box culvert overflow there saved the road this time. 
but we need to clean out the channel below that, rock it, uh, get rid of some willows on that, what I call the peninsula, or that point between the CMP, the main outlet, and the box culvert. Anyway, we're going to enhance that area, put a trail in there, make it more angler friendly. And uh, at certain times of the year, we're going to run water through the CMP and through the box culvert. So, so it should attract white bass to both those areas, spread the anglers out a little bit more. Um, and, and we've kind of given up on trying to keep some kind of a rotary screen in that CMP, the main outlet. Uh, we just haven't come up with anything that works very well and they're expensive to try to maintain. So the feeling is if we run about half and half uh, water releases through the, through the culvert and through the, and through the CMP and through the box culvert, uh, uh, we can have a, a, a shallower area of overflow in both those areas and hopefully keep the trout in there that way. So this work will begin late April, early May. Now, since I'm a white bass fisherman also, um, I kind of want gave them some specific orders not to start on that downstream work during the white bass fishing season which is usually the month of May, but they can start on the upstream work. We'll have to drain the lake down as far as we can. And it shouldn't, it shouldn't dirty up the water too bad because it's mainly sand and they'll be able to do a channel around their excavation work. So uh, the last thing I want to do is mess up that white bass fishing this spring for people. So just be aware of that. We are, we are thinking of you anglers uh, when we're doing this project. Another project that we just completed was out at Goose Lake. We got that done last fall. And it was finally a, a, a long overdue overflow project, a screened overflow on the main dike, the outlet dike at, at the lake. We put about a quarter million dollars worth of work in the, in the Goose Lake in the early 2000s to build dikes and carp barriers and things uh, to try to keep the carp out because if we can, it, it's an outstanding Sandhill Lake fishery. And uh, one of the final pieces to the puzzle is to put in some overflow structures in the main lake to, to evacuate water when we have uh, high water years. And we've had high water for several years, so we finally got it done. And these are just some photos of, of how it looked going in. And uh, Randy North and O'Neill had to bid on this and did a fine job for us. And it just kind of shows you how the completed part of it when they're putting the fabric down, but you can see the screened outlets going through our main dike and through the tubes and off into the pasture to the west. And then it flows down through the pastures and ditches through a lower carp barrier and is, becomes Clearwater Creek. But that's also where the carp get in the lake during high water events. So now we can vacate water. We had a rock plug in there before that just didn't seem to vacate the water like we, we wanted to evacuate water like we wanted. So hopefully this will work a lot better. And, uh, you know, we've, we've completed all of our infrastructure work out there. Now we're just waiting for Mother Nature to drop the water level a little bit so we can get rid of the carp in. Uh, on to some access projects. Um, a year ago, we had, um, be the, the fall of 2020, we completed work um, um, on a new ACM, articulated concrete mat boat ramp at Swan Lake. And we were very happy to get that thing in. Um, it replaced a primitive gravel ramp that you pretty much had to have four wheel drive in a lot of times to put a boat in and out. So we got a new ACM in there and I talked about that at last year's public meeting. But anyway, we, we had a new dock ordered for it and we didn't get the dock in until the spring of 2021. So I just wanted to show you what the new dock looks like at Swan Lake. If you, and if you get out that way, it's gonna be a lot easier if you're by yourself to get a boat in and out of there and tie it up. And uh, you no longer need a four wheel drive to put in there. So we're pretty happy we got that done. I apologize for the snow on the, in the photo, but uh, this was from last spring when we, when we put it in, but I wanted to pass that along. And, and speaking of uh, boat ramps, we did some work at the North Twin boat ramp out south of Bassett. As everybody knows, the sand hill has been full water the last few years, uh, record levels out in that country. <clears throat> and uh, the new boat ramps that we had in at North Twin and South Twin were actually underwater for a period of time. When the water receded this past uh, fall, this is what it looked like at North Twin. There's a fair amount of damage and erosion along the, the concrete apron at the top of the boat ramp. 
so we ordered some rock and this was a this was a do-it-yourself project uh, with our wildlife uh, partners and uh, out of the Bassett office, Kelly Corman and, and his temporary with a skid loader. We ordered some rock, put a better base down, put some fines on top of it, packed it down with that skid loader and it's, it made a very good approach to the boat ramp. So it's all fixed up. So those of you that wanna go out there fishing, uh, no more worries with the boat ramp at this time at North Twin. South Twin's usable also. We need to put a little bit of rock on that. I have to get some ordered and we'll do that ourselves also to place that. But it's yeah. usable the way it is, but I think we can enhance it a little bit. Um, so we'll get to working on that. Yeah, and while we're out in that country, just, just a couple miles away is a, a lake called Peterson Lake. And excuse my spelling on the on the Google Earth photo here. Uh, Peterson Lake was a was a sandhill lake that was formerly in the Open Fields and Water Program. Well, now I can tell you that it is uh, owned by the Game and Parks, or most of the lake is. We did a, a land trade on a different parcel in the sandhills that the commission owned that had a small landlocked lake on it, and we traded for uh, part of Peterson Lake. So we're really happy now that, that we'll have permanent um, access to this lake for the anglers. And uh, those of you who've been out there know that Peterson can be a pretty good lake for perch and bluegill and pike and bass. Um, just a nice sandhill lake. The future plans we have for Peterson is to uh, put in an ACM boat ramp there also, improve the access for boaters. Uh, we're not sure where it's gonna go yet. It's gonna be on the south side of the lake here somewhere. And we'll work that out with the adjacent landowner and um, make plans to get that going. But um, that'll be really nice when we get that done. And, and Peterson received pretty heavy ice fishing pressure this winter. And I, and, and I guess success was pretty doggone good at times. So we're glad to get something going there. And we're glad that it's in commission ownership at this time. And also out in that country in Sand Hills Lakes, we're going to do a boat ramp project at Willow Lake which is southwest of Ainsworth. It's clear out in the corner of our district. <clears throat> and uh, uh, Willow Lake's come on pretty good as a fishery. Uh, we did renovate it a few years ago. We got uh, didn't get all the carp killed, unfortunately, uh, but started stocking walleye in there, and we created quite a walleye fishery out there. And uh, use has been going up on that lake. But uh, we need to replace the boat ramp. It's, it used to be an old tri-lock ramp. Now it's a, a and then we turned it into a primitive gravel ramp. Well, you can see there's quite a scallop where the old boat ramp was that eroded back in there. And uh, the, the plan is, and the plans are sitting on my desk right now to be finalized, um, is we're going to build a bank back up along here towards where the end of our chalking boat is. And you can see Phil out here in a little bit deeper water, but we're going to build this bank up um, and have an approach here and then have an ACM ramp out into the water and we're gonna get the deeper water that way because you gotta back out a long ways right now to get a boat off. And if you got a bunk trailer like I have, it, it, it's, it's an issue. And we're, the old dock is, is history. We're gonna put a new dock in that's gonna be seasonal <clears throat> because of the, the location of the boat ramp and the, and the Northwest winds out there and the ice, it'll, it'll tear a boat dock up. So we're gonna put a boat dock in there that'll be removed uh, seasonally, be removed in the fall. And we'll work with our, wildlife guys on that too and and uh, get that project going and uh, that'll be a great move for the anglers too. Uh, and, and I want to talk a little bit about some other boat ramps and this particular access on the Missouri River. It could be a challenging year on the Missouri to get boats on uh, certain areas this year. The, the Corps of Engineers is basically in a water conservation mode at this point. Uh, releases have been extremely low out of Fort Randall and Gavin's Point Dam this winter, 12,000 at uh, Gavin's and about 9,000 out of Randall and actually zero flow from midnight to 6 a.m. out of Randall. So that's really impacted our Sunshine Bottom boat ramp in Boyd County, as you can see here on the left. Um, it's basically unusable and um, we're waiting for the water to come back up, which will be in a week, but they're only going to bring it up. Um, well, it'll bring it up at, at Randall about 11,000 CFS, so that's about 22 inches it'll come up. We'll have to see if we can if we can get boats in or not. We'll, we'll keep people apprised of that situation, but 
And then I took another picture last week of the Cedar County boat ramp at St. Helena access. And uh, as you can see, the, you know, with 12,000 CFS releases out of Gavin's, um, river stage has dropped four to five feet and the boat ramp basically is unusable. And you can see some old concrete off the end that's, that, that was uh, kind of poured in an emergency situation by Cedar County at one time and it's, it's breaking off. It's about 15 feet from top to, to the water and, a, and a probably a two to one slope. So been consulting with Cedar County on what can be done here. Again, the, the, the river stage will come up in the next couple of weeks, about 20 inches here, but I still don't know if that's enough, but we're gonna see impacts at, at um, Niobrara boat ramp, uh, Brookie Bottom Park boat ramp probably, Ponca, uh, right now I'd imagine those boat ramps are unusable. So, you know, boat ramps that are usable at below Gavin Point Dam, uh, running water up by Niobrara, Verdell ramp west of Niobrara, and uh, the boat ramps at, at Yankton. So like I say, it could be a challenging year because they're looking at a short navigation season and maybe only going up to 26,000 CFS releases out of Gavlins this summer. And their actually projections are to end the navigation season November 1st. So stay tuned. If you're headed up that way to the river, it might be good to call ahead and make sure the boat ramps are usable. I just wanted to give you a heads up on that. Uh, an angler access project that we completed in the past year was down a mile south of Monroe on what was formerly known as the Looking Glass Wildlife Management Area. Uh, I'm proud to say now it's called the Lee Rupp Wildlife Management Area, named after Lee Rupp. And uh, Lee was a fisheries biologist and supervisor here in, in this very office in Norfolk back in the 1970s. Has quite a career. He went on to be a state senator and then uh, working with, with UNL. He's always been involved in conservation and sponsored bills that uh, that uh, were positive for the commission when he was in um, in the legislature and introduced the bill to start the elk season. So anyway, to honor Lee Rupp, uh, the commission renamed the area after him last year, last March. And uh, we had a dedication in September and prior to that dedication, uh, we spruced up the area, uh, redid the parking lot, um, made an ADA pad, ADA sidewalk down to the lake and installed a fishing pier. So it got a nice quiet place for people to go sit and go fishing on the sand pit that's on the area. And there are some quality fish in that sand pit. And uh, credit goes to the wildlife guys and, and their equipment. Jeff Borchers here uh, did a lot of work on the skid loader clearing the brush because it looked, it looked pretty rough when we started. And he, he did a pretty good job with a brush cutter and a skid loader and did the grading and sloping. And we hired a contractor to pour the sidewalk and, and the ADA pad to our specs and um, got a dock out of VW Docks up in Spirit Lake, Iowa, and um, had a local contractor volunteer his time to help put this thing in the water. And we all helped and, and we did it very economically. And uh, and took a lot of satisfaction in this. And I know the Rupp family and Lee himself were very appreciative of this. So uh, very good project for us, very good place for people to go fishing. A couple other things I'm really proud that we finally got done was a couple new fish cleaning stations at Calamus. We switched over from the grinders to the Barracuda units. And those of you um, probably remember the grinders and how they'd plug up and they'd throw spit water back at you and the whole table would shake and you probably saw me out there shaking my fist at them. But anyway, we, um, we uh, got some funding and, and hats off to the fisheries and parks administrators for cooperating on the funding for these units. And we now have, have a new one at Nanda and at Homestead Knowles both at the Calamus. Uh, the first full season was this past year, and as near as I can tell when I was out there, the anglers absolutely love it. They're super quiet. They're more of a roller press system. So they're not throwing water at you, and they're virtually maintenance-free. The only, the, the only complaint was that the, the, they had to be pumped out of, the septic systems had to be pumped out about four times this year because the fishing was so good out there, and there, people were, were uh, cleaning so many white bass, but that's a good thing. That is a real good thing. So we're glad to have these things in. There's more of them. Well, there's more that have been put in uh, other areas in the state. 
and there's more going in as funds become available. So we're switching over to these units. I'm very, very glad to, to report that. And I'll, I want to talk a little bit about some renovation projects that we did and or have coming up. We got Lake 20 um, at, at the Fremont SRA. We got Lake 20 renovated this past September. It was long overdue, but as you remember, it was damaged heavily in the 2019 flooding. Uh, blew out the east end. It was basically connected on both ends of the lake and had a lot of uh, restoration uh, processes that had to go through to, to make it a lake again rather than a flow through system. Anyway, a lot of that's been completed and we were able to get in there and, and kill off the fish and start over. Um, this past September, we got it restocked, bass, bluegill, crappie, catfish, and, and that was our musky lake down there. And we're going to put musky back in there again. So we'll have that opportunity for people in that area. <clears throat> we had planned on doing Lake 16 this spring, but because of some activities, uh, the park division is going to be doing this spring on the lake. We decided to wait till September on that also. So you'll see us uh, getting Lake 16 back online this, this September. I want to talk a little bit about Goose Lake because um, you know, I showed you what, that we got the, the overflow structures in finally, but it, it's in serious need of a renovation. As you can see with the live well and shocking boat over here full of carp, we've hit that magic number of 100 carp per hour. The lake's extremely dirty. We've lost our pike population. We've about lost our perch. We've got some bluegill left that are small and skinny. Uh, the bright spot is the bass population. And I know for some of you listening that like to fish bass out there, it has been good bass fishing, but it's basically two-dimensional carp and bass. And it's just a matter of time before those bigger bass die off also. Water levels are way down, as you can see here. This was a net that we pulled out of the water yesterday doing our pike sample. We had one and a half pike per net. And you know, if we can keep the carp out, we should have 60 to 80 pike per net when we go out there and sample. And like I said, we had a pike and a half. Uh, water levels are down to the edge of the cattail. It's just about enough. Um, I think we can probably get this thing done. And, and we are going to go in there and salvage bass before we, we renovate the, the lake. I uh, just wanted to let you know that. So uh, it, it, it's on the books. We're hoping to get it done. We've been wanting to do it for quite a while. The last time we renovated was 2003, and the lake's as low as it was in 2003 with the current drought that we're in. So stay tuned on that. Now let's talk about a little bit of fish work and some research stuff going on. We got uh, a cooperative effort with South Dakota Game Fish and Parks up on the Missouri River between Gavin Point Dam and Fort Randall Dam to look at movement on Sauger and Walleye in that system. And uh, South Dakota is, is uh, sponsoring the project and they have a grad student on board. His name is Will Radigan, PhD student. And, uh, he's, and he's actually working uh, through UNL and studies under Dr. Mark Pegg. So they're ramrodding the, the project and, and with South Dakota and we got involved as a cooperator. Uh, we bought some sauger tags and we're helping collect the fish we're not only interested in the walleye movement, also our, our native sauger movement. So here's just a couple of photos uh, showing us up on the river last spring. And here's, here's Will, there's Phil helping out and uh, getting ready to put these tags in. And these radio tags are about an inch long. An incision is made, they're put in the abdomen of these fish. Will sews, them, sews the cut back up. And he got really good at that um, after a number of fish. But anyway, sew them back up. We put them back in the river and survival has been excellent on these things. And we tagged 40 walleye and 40 sauger so far. And we spent a lot of time up on the Missouri River and Lewis Clark Lake last spring uh, helping get these fish tagged. And um, <clears throat> we're gonna get some valuable information on the movement. And here's, here's just a map that, that, that Will provides us periodically but, and, and this gives you an idea of these are called listening stations that are that are placed out in the reservoir and in the river. If these tagged fish go up and down this system, they, they're, they're recorded on these listening stations. They get a hit on these listening stations and each one of these tags has a unique number so we know exactly what fish it is. I should also mention that there's a jaw tag put, an external jaw tag put on every one of these fish that are tagged so the anglers, when they see that, they'll know that, they've, that there's, a, there's a radio tag inside that fish, but it's up to them whether they want to release it or whether they want to keep it if it's harvestable size. 
And, uh, you know, we've had a combination of both. We've had, had a fair amount of harvest, but we've had a lot of release fish also. But some of the information we're, we're already receiving is we, we tagged a fish in the uh, sauger in the Niobrara area. And about three weeks later, it was recorded on a listening station that the feds have in place down below Gavin's Point Dam. Traveled 30 some miles in three weeks. Recently, there was a sauger harvested in the Fort Randall Dam tailwaters. Uh, I think it was last week that was tagged in the Verdell area. So a lot of movement going on here. We're trying to figure out a little bit more of the life history on these fish so we can manage this, this, this stretch a little better, um, find out where they live, um, where they move. And, and also part of this study is, is what we call entrainment studies. They're looking at the fish passage through Gavin's Point Dam, not only sauger walleye, but, but other species as well. And they're looking at entrainment movement of any fish through the Port Randall Dam. So we're going to hopefully learn a lot through this process and, and uh, be a little bit better at managing the fishery up there. And while we're talking about Lewis and Clark Lake, I want to talk about some of the walleye stocking we've been doing up there in recent years to try to boost the walleye numbers. Um, we've been requesting one million fingerling, one to two inch fingerling every year in conjunction with the state of South Dakota to try to boost the population up there. Uh, we've seen some declines, particularly since 2011 in that system. And uh, I, I never thought I'd see the day where we'd have stock walleye in Lewis and Clark Lake, but, but we've kind of hit that point. And uh, you can see uh, on, the, on the chart to the left, um, you know, natural fish versus stock fish, the composition of the young of the year that we collect. And in 2019, we had Got a very poor natural year class, but a very good uh, number of our stockfish survived. And um, 2016, also pretty good number, but you can see those stockfish are surviving. And the reason we know that and we can track these things is they're, they're marked with a chemical uh, when they're three day old fry. And when you pull an oval out of the fish, it, the, if they're marked and they're stockfish, they'll have this very distinct uh, gold ring around it. And you have to look at it under a special scope. Phil's pretty good at it. And, um, but, but that way we can tell, and we grab a subsample of young of the year fish, and we can tell how many are stocked and how many are natural and see if they're contributing. If you look over here at the graph on the right, you can see that. Here's, here's our total uh, number of the young of the year collected per hour these years. And then and the red indicates the stock fish for those stocking years. So you can see in 2019, if we didn't stock those fish, we would have missed that whole year class. In 2016, they contributed heavily to that year class. 20, 2021, we had a tremendous natural year class up there. So we hope they stay in the lake and, and come along. But you can see 2011, the big flush year up there when, when we had 160,000 CFS going through the system, that uh, you know, prior to that, we had we had really good natural recruitment, pretty steady. After that, it's been more sporadic. That's why we uh, have undertaken the stocking program. See if we're making a difference. Bottom line is, are they contributing? You know, to the adult fish. And at this time, you would look at this this graph on the lower right and say, well, maybe not so much, because since 2011, we just haven't seen a big recovery of fish in our gill nets in the reservoir itself. However, this past year, from the fish that have been sampled from Lewis and Clark Lake up to Fort Randall, uh, you look at the oldest on some of these older fish, 50% of the age two walleye collected, and that's that 2019 year class, half of them were stocked fish. So those fish wouldn't be there if we weren't stocking. 25% of the age one fish are stocked fish. So that's a positive result. In my mind, we're making an impact to the angler, and that's what we're after. We got something going on in Lewis and Clark where these fish aren't living in the lower reservoir. There's a lot of fish up in the Delta and in that transition zone and then up the river. I think it's related to productivity and food supply, but the studies will be ongoing to figure that out and we will get it figured out. And while we're talking about uh, stocking evaluations and OTC marked fish, I wanna talk a little bit about Calamus and Davis Creek. Those are two ex extremely fished reservoirs. Normally we say, talk about high fishing pressure, but these are extreme fishing pressure lakes. So we're trying to maintain recruitment in those, 
in those lakes and we've, we've gone to a concurrent fry fingerling stocking for walleye to try to prevent missing year classes. And at Calamus for a few years, we've been evaluating which one's contributing the best. And you can see it kind of bounces around. One year fry will do good. One year fingerling will do good. 2020, we did not stock fry. That was a COVID year. Only fingerling were stocked. So that proved once and for all, there's very little natural reproduction in Calamus and the same at Davis Creek. And this past year at Davis Creek, 62% of the young of the year fish we collected um, were, were fry mark fish or fry stock fish, and 38% were fingerlings. So we're going to continue this for uh, uh, at least another five years and see how it's how it goes but right now um you know i'm hesitant to do either just a fry stocking or just a fingerling stocking because there might be some environmental factors in there that you can't control and if you're not stocking you know both of those strategies um you can miss a year class pretty easy and if we miss a year class we're in trouble as far as you anglers are concerned because we're going to see that population drop so that's what we got going on at Calamus and Davis Creek. And speaking of fish stocking, we got a, we stock a lot of fish in this district. And here's some of the highlights on some of the fish we've got requested for this year. You know, we're going to continue to fry fingerling at, at Calamus and Davis Creek to support that recruitment. We're going to continue stocking and requested a million walleye fingerling for Lewis and Clark, and they'll be marked. Uh, we're getting into the advanced walleye stocking in this district also based on the success that the Southeast District has had on some of their lakes. And uh, so we've, we've got uh, four lakes picked out for that. We have tried a couple other lakes. We've, we've eliminated Buckskin Hills and Powder Creek for those advanced fish because they just weren't contributing any better than the fingerling were. And we're st stocking some saw guy out in the Sand Hills, uh, particularly at Whittle Lake. And we're going to be stocking some at North and South Twin. Uh, based on some of the success they've had in the Northwest District with the saw guy and the saw guy in the Southeast District. They seem to do better in some of those turbid lakes and they've been doing very good at Willow Creek. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna try some of those out in the Sand Hills uh, where we're already stocking some walleye. So but we stock a lot of uh, channel catfish. Uh, we stock muskie in, in two lakes, uh, Calamus and Fremont 20. Uh, the black crappie we got requested this year going into Davis Creek. We've had some issues with poor recruitment there. I want to try to make something happen. We can grow some big crappie in that lake. They grow very well. We just need to get, get some small ones in the lake. We need some recruitment. So we're going to try that. So anyway, we, we do stock a lot of fish in this district. Uh, I don't think we overstock and I don't think we waste fish. And I want to show that the picture that I've got in here is a couple of tanks in the bottom of our 20 foot boat. A lot of the smaller fish, the fry and the fingerlings, uh, don't see a net much anymore when we stock them. They get uh, flushed off of a hatchery truck into these tanks on our boat, taken out in the lake and, and then flushed out of the back of the boat through these tubes. So we've got a pretty efficient system for uh, stocking fish that work, seems to work very well and less, less handling of those fish, less stress, better survival. So we're gonna jump into the fishing forecast here quick. And, uh, talk about some of the major species we have and the opportunities that we have in the districts. And I'll go through the statewide graphs that Daryl Bauer puts together. And those are available on our website, outdoornebraska.gov. And you can look them up there under the fishing information and uh, encourage you to do so. But we'll talk a little bit about some of these species listed here and uh, give you our take on them. First one's gonna be walleye. Uh, I've got some good walleye um, lakes in the state, um, kind of spread out all over the state. And I put in some arrows here that show some of our lakes. And uh, our best picks in this district are, of course, Calamus, Davis Creek are two of the top ones. But some of our smaller flood control reservoirs, Maple Creek and Willow Creek, are going to have some opportunities. Um, Lewis and Clark Lake, again, um, even though our net catch is fairly low in Lewis and Clark in the main lake, some great opportunity on the upper end of the lake and up in what we call the chutes and in the river up above. Um, good opportunities. Uh, it takes a little learning to, to, to get used to that area and, and experience it, but uh, don't be afraid to go up there and try it. And that upper Missouri River, uh, Verdell area, um, can be very good fishing at times. So, yeah, and it's a, just a neat stretch of river to go fish. Uh, and also, but I do want to point out the Maple Creek. We've got a pretty good catch in Maple Creek uh, down by Lee and, and these smaller fish. 
that's already the influence of those advanced fingerings that we're stocking. And that's about 10 per acre that we stock. And the other one is cramper. Uh, we've got pretty good net catch on those fish. Again, you see this, the bars for the, the red for the smaller fish. Again, the influence of those advanced walleye already showing up. And we've had great success with the advanced walleye at Skyview right here in Norfolk. So we've got good opportunities for walleye in the district and in the state. And I, and I just want to hone in on a couple of these lakes, Calamus and Davis Creek. I talked about the stocking strategies there. And I just wanted to point out the long-term data set on, on these lakes. Uh, you can see we've been pretty consistent with things at Calamus as far as our gillnet catch goes. We've had a couple little down years here recently. Uh, I think we just missed them during the sample in 2019 because they rebounded quick in 20, 2020 with some bigger fish. And 2021 was down a little bit in both Davis Creek and, and Calamus. Um, Davis Creek had been rolling along pretty good since, since um, Brad and Brad from the Southwest District uh, initiated some stocking when it was in their district. Um, we had a we had a slight dip in 2016 when we had a winter kill on shad and we found out how valuable those shad are to have in there so we sampled adult shad every year prior to uh to the summer season and make sure we got enough but extreme fishing pressure in 2020 extreme 118 boats one saturday uh when i was there <clears throat> incredible so well, that that may have contributed to the drop in 2021 but there's going to be good fishing and you, you see at davis creek you're not going to find a lot of bigger fish in there just doesn't happen too much fishing pressure too much harvest but it's a walleye lake and people seem to be very happy with those 15 to 17 inch walleye that they can take home and eat i know i certainly am and it's a good place to go fishing same with calamus we, we got aggressive with the stocking and the regulations at calamus two under two over reg is in a place now two under 18 two over 18 with four fish and we are seeing some bigger fish over 18 inches so um, there's an opportunity there to catch a few bigger fish. So we're, we're pretty happy with the direction we're going there and continue to keep an eye on it. And as you can see, before, before we started uh, getting aggressive on the stocking and the regulation changes, the mean number of catchable, harvestable wall, I should say, per net was, was about 3.8, so a little under four. Now it's over nine. So what that means is that the angler's got to got a much better chance now of, of taking fish home to eat if they go to the Calamus. And people really have. It's been a destination lake for walleye. I uh, got white bass fishing across the state is pretty good with Harlan leading the way. I don't think anybody can compete with Harlan. Certain years at the Calamus we can, uh, but Davis Creek, Calamus, Lewis, Clark are our major white bass lakes here. And uh, I've got those highlighted. And, and, and don't forget about the Gavin's Point tailwaters. I get a pretty good run of white bass down there certain times of the year. I just wanted to zoom in a little bit on the white bass at Calamus and Davis Creek, long-term data sets again. Uh, we were down a little bit in the Calamus in, in, in 2021. Uh, really heavy harvest uh, last year at, at the Calamus, a lot of pressure on white bass. I think they're going to be okay, though. I, I really believe we've got more than five per net out there uh, and that we miss some of those smaller fish. Uh, but we'll keep a close eye on that. Hopefully, Mother Nature will give us a good spawn this year. And at Davis Creek, it bounces up and down. They're, 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 our catch there is really hit and miss. Um, you know, you can't tell me those fish from 2018 disappeared by 2019. But uh, the opportunity is there at Davis Creek. I see a lot of fish on the surface. Uh, in June, chasing shad when we're stocking a little walleye, uh, and they catch a lot of fish at the end in the spring of the year. So those are two good lakes for white bass. And um, wiper fishing across the state, uh, you know, mainly you got to head west and southwest to get wipers. You know, branched oak is the kind of the exception on that. <clears throat> and uh, the wiper I'm holding up in the photo is a is a 24 incher of, from Davis Creek collected last spring when we were looking for shad. So Davis Creek, Calamus are two wiper lakes in the district, and again, long term data sets on those um, shows shows pretty steady at, at times. Uh, we've got good recruitment going on in both those lakes. We had a, a number of larger fish being built up the last few years at Calamus, and unfortunately. We ran into some bacterial infections in the spring of the year, right after ice out, and we lost a lot of those bigger fish. 
now they're building back up again with the recruitments there. Hopefully we see some bigger fish. And it seems like we have periodic die-offs at the Calamus and they, and they are from bacterial infections. Don't know why they're, they're happening there, but they do. And it's usually right after ice out in the spring of the year. So anyway, we're gonna have good opportunities, especially at Davis Creek. There's a lot of, a lot of wipers in Davis Creek right now. Good bass fishing across the state and, and our district is no exception. We didn't have the opportunity to do a lot of night chalking this year to collect bass on our lakes. Cause like I said, we spent most of our time up on, on the Missouri River and Lewis and Clark Lake helping with the walleye project last year. And uh, you know, here's Goose Lake. This, this catch is, is from our daytime electro fishing during our carp survey. And you can see there are some nice fish at, at Goose Lake and a fair number of them. Uh, but a lot of our lakes, you know, we get in that 100 to, to 200 per hour electrofishing uh, range, um, and you can expect good bass fishing and good size structure. And we've got, got the picks over here on the left uh, for some of the lakes that we think are going to be a good bet that you can't go wrong with if you want to catch some bass. And Phil in the upper left-hand photo is holding a couple bass from one of the Fremont lakes that we collected. Um, Two years ago and they're they're kind of a sleeper down there they've got some really good fishing and there's some really good bass lakes down there <laughs> but any of those lakes listed grove maple creek cramp or summit maskentine uh you really can't go wrong going there and bass fishing and you're going to have the opportunity to catch a big fish a five pound plus fish at grove and maskentine so uh, it's a good opportunity and to, to show you that this, this is what some of our lakes looked like the last couple three years when we did get out to sample you can see we've got some fish in that 15 to 20 inch range. Mask and time, we've got a little blip in the greater than 20 inch range, but good size structure on most of our lakes, abundant bass in that 150 plus catch rate. Um, good opportunities there folks to get out and chase those bass. Um, also same way with bluegill. We've got some good bluegill lakes in the district. Uh, you can peruse through the, the statewide graph uh, at your leisure and download that off of our website. Uh, but our, our best picks are Cramper, Grove, Summit, Maple Creek, and Maskentine. Probably can't go wrong on any of those lakes to catch some nice bluegill. And here's just an example of some bluegill that we sampled at Summit Lake. Uh, nice bluegill down there. Uh, we can grow them, uh, keep, keep the water quality good and keep the habitat in the lake and we can grow bluegill in this district with the best of them. Uh, and crappie is the same thing. We, we may not have a Whitney or a Wanahoo, uh, places like that. Southeast district really got some good crappie lakes and Sherman's always a crappie factory consistent year to year. But, uh, you know, we've got some crappie in Davis Creek. We're gonna try to make something happen there, as I mentioned. Willow Creek's been a pretty good fishery. We've got some water quality issues there, but it, it's pretty good crappie fishery in the spring of the year. And uh, the lakes we have listed on the left are, are good bets. You know, Summit, here's Phil holding a couple of Summit crappie from last year that we collected in the frame nets. Uh, so there's some nice fish down there. Again, Willow Creek Grove has, has an abundance of intermediate sized crappie right now got a good year class coming on and cramper and maple creek kind of rounded out that uh, anglers are successful catching crappie there particularly in the spring of the year and you can take your pick on channel catfish um, just about any lake in the district is good for channel catfish um, davis creek has has a, a number of large channel catfish this is one that that um, collected last spring when we were sampling there um, been doing really good in, in Davis Creek, as you can see here on, on the, the chart, statewide chart. Um, Calamus is a, is a tournament lake. People like to fish that. It's known for its big catfish. And I'll point out that even though our gill net at Calamus is low, that's because where we set our gill nets for walleye and white bass, we're not uh, successfully collecting the catfish. I'm convinced of that. Because we'll be there running our nets and the guys are fishing out in 40 feet of water and, and knocking the big catfish with rod and reel and we're not seeing them in our nets. They, they are out there. But all of these lakes are, are full of catfish, including the Missouri River. That Niobrara area in the spring of the year, they, they hone in on the Niobrara River and run up the river. Excellent catfishing, excellent size structure fish over 25 inches. So uh, just a matter of going fishing to catch catfish.
and some miscellaneous species. We're getting towards the end here. Uh, one dimension musky. Now I listed Merritt up here, even though it's not in my district, it's in the Northwest district, but uh, and it's known for its, its musky. Well, <clears throat> here's a 42 incher from the Calamus that was chalked last spring. They were spawning in the smart weed beds last spring. We have a fair number of, of musky at the Calamus with some rather large individuals and they're doing very well. We stock them every two to three years. Whenever they're available, we stock a thousand musky. People do target them there. It's kind of a sleeper when it comes to, to musky because everybody hears about Merritt and maybe Elwood. Uh, but it's a very good musky lake and you can catch musky there. The opportunity is there. Uh, I gotta mention smallmouth bass anytime you talk about this district because uh, from the dam at Gavin's Point Dam all the way up to the state line with South Dakota smallmouth bass territory. You find rocks, find the proper habitat, you're going to find smallmouth bass. Throw cranks, throw jigs. You can work the river up in that Verdell area and, and catch fish there. The, the very upper end towards South Dakota state line from the Sunshine Bottom Boat Ramp upstream on the rocks, excellent smallmouth fishing. Uh, it's, it's an opportunity that, that uh, if you ever tried it, you'd really get hooked on it. And some other species that we have, yellow perch, which we don't haven't mentioned a lot about yellow perch in this district. We, we, we're not as good as the Northwest District, some of their Sandhill Lakes and the Refuge Lakes, but Swan and Twin Lakes have pretty good perch fishing in them. We're gonna try to get the perch fishery back in Goose. We can get that renovated. Uh, Willow Lake's got some, some opportunity. Yellowthroat WMA's got some, some opportunities for perch. And then Peterson. And Peterson. The, the, the one we just acquired, uh, Peterson's a good perch lake. So you got to go to the western part of the district to find perch, um, but, but they do exist. And, and as evidenced by this picture here, we, some of them in our sample, we can grow some pretty nice perch out in that country. But Swan's got a lot of perch in it now, and it's on the upswing for perch. So just want to mention that. Now I got to talk about invasive species, you guys. We are kind of... AIS Central up here in the Northeast District. And uh, it's, it's not a thing we're proud of, but it's nothing we can, can control. Uh, we've got everything from Asian carp, which are thick in the Missouri River below Gavin's Point Dam. I think you're all aware of that. They have to stay there. If they get above Gavin's Point Dam, and there's only one way they can get there, and that's by somebody with a bucket. They get above Gavin's Point Dam and Lewis and Clark Lake, it's gonna be an ecological disaster. And it's gonna impact everything from the fisheries to the recreational boating. So hopefully people won't move those around. We have invasive crayfish below Gavin's Point Dam, rusty crayfish, red swamp crayfish. Of course, zebra mussels are, are found up there and they really exploded again in 2021. They first showed up in 2014 and we're on an exponential growth curve for a while. Now they're to the point where they kind of oscillate from year to year. And last year was, was they were on the high note, uh, extremely numerous. And they're just another competitor for the zooplankton that our fish feed on. And uh, it's too bad they're there. They're never gonna go away and they're causing problems in the system. Don't spread them around. And, and you know we do have AIS technicians. We'll have two of them in the district hopefully this year doing boater inspections and, and interviews and making sure that people aren't going from lake to lake with live wells full of water or have zebra mussels on them. If you are boating on the Missouri River or Lewis and Clark Lake or Francis Case or Lake Sharp in South Dakota, uh, you are in infected waters and please be careful, make sure everything is clean, drained and dried before you come to any other reservoirs in the state of Nebraska so we don't spread zebra mussels around, it's so important. If you see something looking like this, a multiple plate sampler hanging off the boat dock this summer, please leave it there because those are zebra mussel adult samplers. Here's what they look like when they come out at Lewis and Clark Lake in the Missouri River at the end of the year. We don't want to see that in any of our other lakes. And uh, one other thing I want to mention is uh, the photo in the lower right is a yellow bass. Please don't spread fish around. This yellow bass, this pregnant female came out of Summit Lake. Um, Iowa across our border has yellow bass in some, in some reservoirs. And this is probably where they came from. Somebody introduced them into Summit Lake. And um, year before last at one of our stations, we actually had a higher catch rate of yellow bass in one of our electric fishing stations than we did largemouth bass. 
please don't spread these things around. They overpopulate, they stunt, and they're about as bad as white perch. And you hear the Southeast guys talk about white perch all the time, which we have in the Fremont Lakes also. And we encourage people to never spread fish around. It is against the law, it's against our regulations. Please don't do that. And we, we also have some aquatic vegetation we're extremely concerned about uh, that's invasive, not only the curly pondweed that dominates our lakes in the spring of the year, uh, and everybody knows about that. It usually dies off about the 1st of July, and at least the lakes become fishable again. Well, if we get Eurasian water milfoil spread around anymore, that stuff doesn't die off in the summertime. It's there year round, and it, it, it's not good. Uh, also, brittle naiad was found in Cramper Lake at Danish Alps Recreation Area by, by Hubbard. Um, our AIS uh, coordinator, Chris Starr, is doing a lot more sampling for vegetation. He found brittle naiad. That's a bad one, too. That's a nasty invasive. Iowa's dealing with that. And since we're only 12 miles out of Sioux City at Hubbard, uh, probably came out of Iowa with a boat. A lot of these things spread by fragmentation. So it, it's, it's key that you get, them, get the vegetation off your trailer, off your boat before you leave, because uh, just one fragment can, can inoculate a different lake with uh, an undesirable vegetation. And speaking of the Eurasian water milfoil, here's the lakes in Nebraska that Chris found Eurasian water milfoil in last year. They also found out that it does hybridize, which makes it harder to kill. It takes a different um, chemical to kill that. But, but we don't want to get that spread around the state any worse than it is. Uh, we have some in Goose Lake. It's pretty much disappeared at this time. We've seen some in Lake Erickson in the past in Wheeler County. But please, please be mindful of the vegetation hanging off your trailer when you leave. We're going to do the best we can in this district to treat around boat ramps again this spring and knock that vegetation back um, so that when you back a boat in, it doesn't come out full of weeds. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll work on it as best we can. If you help us out, work on it as best you can. We'd sure appreciate that. And we appreciate your patience and your cooperation with our AIS techs uh, because they're, they're doing a difficult job out there contacting a lot of people. And we appreciate your cooperation with that. So with that, here's our contact information. Again, I'm Jeff Shuckman. This is Phil Litton over here. And um, yeah, it's time to go fishing. But uh, um, on, on, a, on a different note, on a personal note, um, I just want to say this will probably be my last uh, district update and, and, and uh, fishing show that we put that I put on. Um, I've been around this Norfolk office uh, for about 40 years now and um, doesn't look like there's going to be a uh, 41 years involved. So I just want to thank everybody that, uh, for putting up with me all these years and I've always done my best to try to uh, um, do the best I could for the angler and make, make the fishing the best we could in Northeast Nebraska. I'm a native of Northeast Nebraska. It's been a privilege to work here all these years, and um, I'm going to see you out on the water. I'm going to spend a lot more time fishing. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Tony, and we'll see what we got for questions. Great job, Jeff, and and appreciate all the all the work put in over the year and over the years. Um, you you truly are one of the um, champions for our anglers and our constituents. So. Um, we can't let Jeff and Phil off the hook too uh, too quickly. We got we got time for questions. We have a uh, our Northwest District meeting will actually be starting here in about forty five minutes. Um, and if if people are uh, wanting to hear more fish talk and, and and things going on in the Northwest District, we'll post a link in the in the chat so you can register for that meeting as well if you'd like. But right now we're going to turn this thing over to uh, Jordan Cott. He's He's our moderator working with uh, one of our other staff members, Joe Spooner, and they're, they're um, collecting all the comments in the chat. Please, uh, please don't be shy. Uh, uh, add your comments, your questions in that chat, chat box, and we'll do our best to, to answer those. All right. Um... Don't have a lot of questions right now. So like Tony said, if you got anything, uh, please, 
please uh, add them in there. Uh, first question is regarding walleye in Summit Lake. Uh, Jeff and Phil, do you care to uh, comment on how the walleye are doing up there? Yeah, I'd, I'd say they're doing pretty well. Um, right now, there's a lot of small fish being caught from those um, advanced fish that we're stocking. And even prior to that, we were stocking fry in there. Um, what was it, a couple hundred thousand fry a year? Yeah. And, uh, you know, our, our goal for our gill net catch is five to ten per net. And every time we've gone down there and sampled, we've, we've met that objective. Uh, I know at times anglers have done well, at times they haven't done so well. But um, I'd say things are going to be on the upswing there with, with uh, what we're seeing so far in the survival of those uh, advanced fish that we've been stocking. We had a fair number of reports from people catching those advanced, advanced stock fish last fall already, uh, catching good numbers of them. So things are looking good. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, question about uh, walleye spawn at Calamus. Where this is specific to why don't they spawn on the dam? But do you guys have any ideas on where they do spawn at uh, Calamus Reservoir? We have very little natural reproduction there. They will attempt to spawn on the dam, but the dam is soil cement, so there's no rock there. So it's not a suitable substrate really for them to have a successful spawn. But we have back in the day run some, some gill nets on the dam at Calmus and we were able to catch some, some uh, spawning sized fish there. Um, you know, we really don't have a lot of rock in the reservoir and, and you know, they, but they still do seem to concentrate some on the dam in the spring of the year. But as evidenced by our OTC marking of these stocked fish, you know, not, I think 96% of the young of the year we collected there were stock fish. So there's very little natural reproduction and, and uh, likely won't be. All right. Uh, what about at Twin Lakes? Have you guys stocked pike in there? No, not yet. Um, we had talked about that when we renovated them because they were known for their pike. Uh, of course, with pike in the sand hills, you know, some people love them, some people hate them. <clears throat> what we were trying to do at Twin Lakes was to get the panfish to come on first and see if we could, you know, really have some gangbuster pan fishing out there with yellow perch and bluegill and crappie before we introduced another large predator out there. Um, you know, that's, that's not off the table as far as stocking goes. Unfortunately, you know, I think everybody knows we did get carp back in, in that system. We had that entire system carp free for two or three years. Yeah. And um, until high water event, I think that might have been 2019 also. And somewhere carp got back in there. Uh, some of the locals have differences of opinion where they came from, but uh, we're trying saw guy in, the, in, in North and South Twin. Um, to have an additional predator in there that's not quite as hard, hard on things as pike. If the majority of the anglers want pike back in that system, uh, we can do that. We can certainly do that because uh, it, it did used to be a, a destination for northern pike at one time. So, yeah. And keep in mind, close by now, we own Peterson Lake and it does have pike in it. Uh, so that's an opportunity down near there. And we also got carp and a couple other sandhill lakes uh, in that flood year of 2019 also. Peterson actually had, yeah, has them in it for the first time and then uh, South Pine or Cozette as some people know it uh, got carp in that year also. We'll see what happens with the fisheries and those. All right, very good. Thanks guys. Um, next question is about uh, fish management on the upper Missouri River, and maybe you could just talk about how um, just those border waters in general on the Missouri River are, are co-managed with our, our um, border states in South Dakota and Iowa, because I know you guys deal a lot with, with that and communicate a lot with our partner agencies in those states. Yeah, we, we sample Lewis and Clark Lake and some on the river up above, and um, in conjunction with South Dakota, uh, 
they have their methodology, we have ours, and then and then we compare our data every year. We get together annually with South Dakota in what we call border water meeting with their biologists, administrators, law enforcement, and discuss what's going on up there, where we're at with our samples, where we're at with the research and fish docking and things like that. And, um, you know, because it is a border, we have, you know, um, I guess, equal interest from both states. Um, and right now, a lot of it, the management up there, especially on walleye and stuff, involves just movement study and, and stocking. Um, you know, I'm, I'm disappointed in the numbers down in the lake because it can be much better, but we're coming up on some low release years. Last year was one and this year. Typically, we see a relationship between the amount of water released out of Gavin's and, and the number of fish in Lewis and Clark Lake as far as all Lance Auger go. So hopefully we're gonna see those numbers build, but now you, you throw in some confounding factors of zebra mussels and the, the, the big flush in 2011, that when we lost all of our emerald chiners and they haven't come back. So I think we're dealing with some, some issues of, of uh, prey, but uh, uh, yeah, we do manage it on below Gavin's. Right now it's full Asian carp. Um, there's not a lot of management. I hate to say it, not a lot of management we're doing at this time down there. Everybody's trying to figure out what's going to happen with the Asian carp. And is, is there anything we can ever do about the Asian carp? They dominate the biomass below Gamma Point Dam. But with that said, the bright spot is if there is one with them, archers love them. They, they, they come from a long ways to shoot big head carp. And you can go in the tailwaters of Gavin Point Dam or down the river. And I mean, you can shoot till your arms drop off. Uh, so people need to take advantage of that uh, and, and utilize them, and they are a good eating fish. But but the biomass below Gavin's is dominated. Uh, you get farther down, I heard of, of some pretty good catches on fish down at uh, Decatur this year, and uh, and they catch some sovereign walleye in the Ponca area. Uh, it's, it's not quite like it was 30 years ago. Uh, by any means, but there are some opportunities down there for those people who want to fish the wing dikes and some of the pools in that pond area. So I hope well, I hope that in my ramblings, I've kind of answered your question a little bit. Thanks, guys. Um, this could go well. I'll I'll go to the next one here. Uh, Tony, does Nebraska have a non-game aquatic biologist? Yeah, our, uh, our non-game aquatic biologists would be serving essentially in our uh, rivers and streams program manager role. So that's Thad Huneman. I, I posted his contact information in the chat uh, chat window. He, him and his team, he has a team of two right now. Joe, Joe Spooner is on that team. Um, they deal the most with monitoring native fish species in our rivers and streams and working on different projects to help enhance those populations. And I'll, I'll go back to uh, Jeff and Phil. Um, thoughts on uh, minimum length for crappie at Davis Creek. Uh, some anglers are upset that uh, small fish are getting harvested up there. Well, I, I guess I can answer that too. Uh, personally, I'm not a big fan of it there. I'm not a big fan of minimum length limits unless we have an up, uh, a situation like Sherman where we've got consistent recruitment. Um, the fish are growing fast at Davis Creek. Um, you know, I hate to rob anybody of, of the opportunity of, of, of keeping what I consider eating size crappie. Um, and there's no guarantee they're going to be there the next year, uh, especially in that reservoir. Um, yeah, it depends if, if we get if we get recruitment, good year class strength. We're going to have some nice crappie there in, in, without a, a 10 inch minimum. Um, and that's the, that's the key to Sherman being so good year after year. But um, yeah, in, in, in my philosophy, the way to manage panfish a lot of times is rather than a minimum is to, is to go with reduced bag limits. So I don't know if Phil wants to add anything onto that, but, but at this time, I'm not ready to propose anything like that. Right now at Davis Creek, it's more of a, it is a numbers thing. We're having some recruitment issues. Uh, 
and we are trying to address that, address that with stocking. We think it's probably the recruitment issues and reproduction issues are probably tied to the highly fluctuating water levels out there. Uh, so we're trying to mitigate that through stocking and see what we can do on that end uh, to start with. Thanks, guys. Um, stay with you two. Thoughts on adding a fish cleaning station at Valley View at Calamus? <laughs> um, I think it'd be great, but that's up to administration. Those things are about whew, just the unit and stuff themselves, about $46,000, and that doesn't include the tank and everything that goes in. And since we've got two of them there on the area, it's, it's unlikely at this time that we're going to have one up there. And, and um, I'll tell you what concerns me most at the Calmus and even anymore, and I know there's been some park development up at Valley View, and it'd be nice to have a fish cleaning station there, don't get me wrong. That, that's an administrative decision on funding. The thing that bothers me the most about the upper end of Calamus and that Valley View area is sedimentation. Got a tremendous amount of sediment coming in down the Calamus River. And if, and if something isn't done to address that and clean some of that out, uh, in the next few years, I think we're going to be looking at some problems. It's going to, it's not going to be too that much farther in the future that the Valley View area is going to be impacted by that sediment. Then if we have a bunch of infrastructure there, uh, may or may not even be usable. And, and I, uh, that's, you know, just, just kind of my take on it going forward in the future. But back to the original question, uh, yeah, I think it'd be a good idea, but it, it's, a, it's a funding issue and Tony can probably... <laughs> answer that better than I can. You, you said it pretty, pretty good, Jeff, as far as we got, we got two on the area and we have a lot of state rec areas that we're continuing to make improvements on and, and uh, do these updates too. So if, if anything would happen, it would probably be a ways down the road for sure. All right. Uh, last question I have, as of right now, and uh, I think Joe Cassidy, he was on, uh, hopefully he's still on, uh, asking if the Grove Trout Rearing Station is closed. Uh, I know you answered it in the uh, the chat, but if you care to jump on in case anybody missed it, otherwise if, uh, if Tony wants to handle that one. Yeah, yeah. if... if if Joe isn't Joe isn't on anymore, yeah, I can answer it. Uh, basically, repeat what he had mentioned is it was closed. It is open right now. It was closed temporarily um, last fall. We were having some fish health issues, so the more those fish are, um, you know, the more people are around them, walk past them, the more stressed they can become, and they can be susceptible to this disease. And then there was some staffing shortages too with a retirement, and then trying to fill, uh, fill that spot. So a couple of things that have created some issues as far as keeping that facility open, but it is open now. All right, I think we've addressed everything uh, that's come up in the chat. If anybody else has any other questions, uh, please feel free to type them in there right now. Otherwise I'm gonna turn it back over to uh, Jeff and Tony. Go ahead, Jeff, if you have any closing remarks. Well, I just I just want to thank everyone for tuning in and and hopefully we've enlightened people on, on what we've got going. Like I say it's just kind of a sample of what we have going on in this district. And and um, you know, we're looking forward to getting out in the field, which we've already started this week. And um, um, yeah, I think uh, I've probably talked long enough. It's uh, time for people to start take a little break hit the bathroom break and then tune into the Northwest district and see what the guys out there have to say. Jeff, we did have one more uh, come up regarding uh, the Missouri river and Lewis and Clark and sedimentation issues. Um, have you had any uh, correspondence with the army Corps dealing with that? Yeah, there's, there's actually a um, sedimentation study going on on Lewis and Clark Lake with the, uh, Missouri Sediment Action Coalition, MSAC, cooperating with the Corps of Engineers. Uh, I've sat in on a number of those meetings 
and the stakeholders meetings with that. Uh, they're looking at the options and right now they're doing economic models on those options as to the cost benefit ratios. So things have been moving forward on that. Um, I'm hopeful at this point that there, there can be a long-term solution to the sediment up there. Uh, it's never going away, obviously, and we need to get that sediment below Gavin's anyway. Um, uh, it, it's always been a contentious issue up there. Uh, the sediment does form those chutes and sandbar complexes as it comes down into the reservoir, which are valuable, extremely valuable for fisheries and wildlife, uh, fur bears, waterfowl, you name it. Uh, but it's filling in the lake and it's got a limited life. Uh, I'm not a big fan of draining the lake and sluicing it. I hope that doesn't happen. We're not to that point yet. It's not feasible at this point. I think everybody agrees on that. But there, there has to be a sustainable uh, solution to probably passing that sediment down through the dam in some fashion. But yes, we are involved in it. We've been, uh, the, the core is involved. Uh, there's been a lot of work behind the scenes with that. And I'm hopeful within the next year or so, uh, they'll have a pretty good list of viable op options that are economically feasible to, uh, to do something and address that, get that going. With all this um, COVID money going around, uh, too bad we can't tap into some of that because funding's always an issue. But uh, yeah, you're gonna see more, more coming on on the sedimentation issue in the future. Good question. So yeah, I just want to mention that the uh, the dialogue doesn't have to stop here, as you can tell, and as Jeff has said, um, they're they're always welcome to phone calls, emails, stop-ins, everything like that. They they love uh, being able to being able to uh, provide any information they can to help your experience better. So feel free to reach out to them at any point. I um, want to thank all our fishery staff, all of the agency staff that was on here tonight to, to help out and provide support. And uh, I'll turn it over to our division administrator, Dean Rosenthal, who, who is the leader of this group, uh, to, to bring us home. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Jeff and Phil. We really appreciate all the effort you guys put into this tonight. Thanks to Jordan and... Uh, Joe on getting the questions moving and stuff. I want to really thank all the people that joined on tonight to be a part of this, uh, ask questions, uh, gather this information up for this year's season of fishing. Uh, it's going to be a great year. Um, we look forward to these opportunities to spend time with our constituents, with you guys that and gals that are fishing to find out what your interests are, to let you know what we're doing and what the fishing forecasts are, what the outlook is, um, exchange information. Like Tony said, the guys are always there. Our phones are always available. Our emails are available. Uh, we look forward to the opportunities to exchange that information. Also wanna take the opportunity to thank our volunteer fishing instructors uh, that help us out from time to time in our fishing workshops and stuff. And I just want to hope everybody has a good evening. And if you get a chance, join us for the Northwest meeting. Thank you.